Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director at the Long Now Foundation. And as you know, we like to select a long short uh, before each of these talks. And that's a short film that exemplifies long-term thinking. This month's came uh, from a friend of mine, uh, Daisy Ginsberg, and her team that, uh, that worked on the, uh, an entry for the iGEM competition. And some of you may remember in Drew Endy's uh, synthetic biology talk, he mentioned that there's a student competition for synthetic biology. And uh, this particular group won in 2009 with their project called eChromi. And uh, I think it'll give you an idea of not only uh, some of the context of tonight's talk, but also where some of this may be going synthetically in the future. Thanks. ECROMI is an experimental collaboration between designers and scientists working in synthetic biology. In 2009, seven Cambridge University undergraduates spent the summer learning the tools of synthetic biology, which is essentially a new approach to genetic engineering. Using standardised sequences of DNA in a format that's called BioBricks, they learnt to engineer bacteria. They designed their own BioBricks using genes copied from existing organisms, inserted them into E. coli, and created bacteria that secrete colours visible to the naked eye. E. coli went on to win the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition at MIT in 2009. And joining us now is one of the winners of the iGEM competition. Welcome to Science Friday, Ms. Mullen. Hi, thank you so much. I am part of the Cambridge 2009 iGEM team, and our project was called eChromi. And what we were trying to do is to improve bacterial biosensors. They're bacteria um, that can tell you the concentration of a pollutant in water. And they can do this because inside them they have a detector. So we developed um, two different parts, the sensitivity tuner, and this actually tells the detector when to turn on and when to turn off. So you have control over um, what level of the pollutant you're detecting. And how does the bacteria show that it's on or off? We use something called a color generator, which means that our bacteria changed color when the detector got switched on. Wow, so they light up in a different color. They actually change color. It's visible to the naked eye. So let's say if you put a swab of the bacteria in the a polluted river, the bacteria would just change color. Yep, exactly. So you'd probably want to put a sample of your water on a bacterial plate, maybe not the other way around. <laughs> well, how would you envision something like this being used other ways in the future? As designers, we worked with the team to explore eChromite's potential as they were developing it in the lab. And together, we imagined the timeline proposing ways that living color could evolve over the next century. These scenarios, some of which are shown in this film, explore the different agendas that could shape eChromite's use and in turn our everyday lives. One of the first real applications for this technology may arrive quite soon. A cheap disposable biosensor for testing groundwater contaminated by arsenic. Bacteria could also be used to produce natural colourings and dyes. By 2015 there may be a profession of people who hunt for new pigments in the genes responsible, bringing them back for use in the food and textile industry. By 2039 you can go to the supermarket and buy the simple probiotic yoghurt for cheap personalised disease monitoring. The yoghurt drink contains E. bacteria, which establish a colony in your gut. They monitor for chemical signals that indicate the presence of a wide range of diseases. If they detect a disease, they start generating the corresponding coloured pigment, producing an easily visible output to prompt you to seek your doctor. 2049 sees the rise of the Orange Liberation Front, a terrorist organisation from the Netherlands who are angry because a biotech company in China has patented the gene for the colour orange. In 2069, Google releases pollution mapping bacteria into the atmosphere that turn red in the presence of excess CO2. And as the saying goes, red sky in the morning, Google health warning. Our collaboration meant that eChromi was a technology that's designed from the start at both the genetic and the human scale, and with a long-term outlook. We found that design and science could have a meaningful exchange in the lab, which could prove useful when developing technologies in the future. Hi, I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. I remember the day of computer hackers and seeing what these biohackers are up to. They're terrifyingly responsible, which one would want them to be. Um, of course, they're working with a very large organism, mostly bacteria. Uh, we're going to get to the really little guys tonight. 
Carl Zimmer is a uh, science writer, and that interests me because scholars write about science in a certain way for a certain audience, and it doesn't generalize often very well. Scientists write about their science very well and talk about it very well, but they typically are focusing on the problems that they're most interested in and not necessarily how it fits in except um, in a kind of highly directed way. Whereas a good science writer, journalist, knows all that stuff but is also aware of why it's newsworthy, where it fits into the general picture of that science, that discipline, and the world's needs, and the news situation. So journalists spend a lot of time keeping up not only with the science, but with the world and where they fit together. Uh, Carl Zimmer has written this beautiful little book, it's as small as a virus, that uh, he'll be signing afterwards. And the other thing happening afterwards is there's a reception right over there at the Long Now Museum, and hope to see you there. Meanwhile, here's Mr. Virus, Carl Zimmer. Uh, thank you, Stuart, uh, and thank you all for coming. So um, my talk tonight is called uh, Viral Time, and it's the kind of title that needs a little explanation. Uh, it's kind of a way of asking a question, uh, and the question for me is, is what is time in the world of viruses? Um, I think with any such question, you have to start with ourselves, uh, talk about our own experience with time, and then try to bootstrap our way out from there. Um, so, so what is time for us? Um, what is a day? You know, if you're in an airport and your plane is delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed and then finally canceled, and then you spend the night in the airport and you finally get out 24 hours later, that's a very long day. Um, but let's say that um, while you're dealing with that, you met some guy, seemed pretty nice, struck up a conversation with them, had a drink, uh, and then by the end of those 24 hours, he's head over heels in love with you and proposes and talks about how he wants to have children with you and s scatter rose petals on your grave when you die, <laughs> you might say, whoa, wait, it's only been a day. So, I mean, a, a, a human day can feel very long or way too short, um, just depending on the scale of what's happening in it. There's, there's a natural time scale for our lives and, and our experiences. And, you know, if you look across the natural world, um, there are different time scales. So, um, this is Ming the Clam. Uh, Ming was uh, minding its own business off the coast of Iceland when some uh, English marine biologists very rudely dredged it up and we're kind of curious to figure out how old it was. And you can actually age clams by uh, counting their rings on their shells. And it turned out that it was about 400, 410 years old. So when Ming, Ming was actually named after the dynasty when it was born, and uh, this was around the time, you know, Shakespeare was writing his plays and so on. Um, but, you know, by the time Shakespeare was dead... Ming was still, you know, just getting started on its life. Um, it has seen, you know, the rise of uh, modern civilization um, and uh, basically uh, might have gone on living who knows how much longer uh, if it hadn't been uh, judged up by curious scientists. Now, it's, it's a hazardous exercise to try to get inside the mind of a clam we can have a debate of where, where the clams have minds, but I, I am curious what it's, it was like for Ming. Um, you know, for that day that can feel so long to us, what's it like for Ming? Was it just like a few minutes? Um, would Ming feel like 10 years was still not long enough to get to know 
another clam to get into a long-term relationship? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but uh, certainly the experience of time and the scales of time for Ming are very different than, say, for a mayfly. Um, when a mayfly emerges as an adult, uh, it may live for only a day or just a few hours. So uh, I would bet that the mayfly would be more than willing to get married in that 24-hour period um, because it was going to be dead pretty soon. Um, so, in fact, it might even have proposed to you a few seconds after meeting you. Now, if you think about life in terms of these time scales, um, when you think about a virus, maybe a virus is kind of like a mayfly's mayfly. Um, you know, the, the, uh, because a virus's way of making more viruses happens really fast. Um, you know, a mayfly has to go from being an egg to being an adult and then reproducing and producing more eggs. And that, that does take a while. But viruses are fast. So this uh, diagram here uh, just shows you the sort of a basic cycle of one virus. I picked out the flu virus. So you get a, you get a virus, which is basically genes and a protein shell. It comes into uh, uh, a uh, host cell. For, hu for humans, they're, they're going to come into the cells that line your airway. Uh, they're going to basically pop off their uh, protein shell, and the genes are going to start um, being copied into new genes. And those genes are going to be wrapped in new protein shells, and then, boom, new viruses are going to pop out. This does not take long. Um, this can take a matter of, of minutes or hours before you're having uh, new viruses being assembled. So uh, that is basically why viruses um, live in some ways in such a different time scale than we do. Um, it doesn't take very long for a virus infection to explode inside you. Um, a single virus uh, could, over the course of, say, a few days, produce millions, sometimes even billions, of viruses. And so, when you get a, the flu or the cold and you sneeze, each one of those droplets is going to be loaded with viruses because they replicate so fast. So, you can kind of think of the, that little circle of arrows there kind of like the hands on a clock, and that clock is moving very fast. And, and that means not just that you're going to have a lot of viruses, um, but it also means that those viruses are going to undergo changes that are very different than what we're familiar with. Um, because... The, thi the, prob the thing about viruses is that every time they copy themselves or that they get copied, they're very sloppy. So uh, when we have kids, um, we m they might acquire, each of them, about 100, 130 new mutations in their DNA. But our genomes are huge, about 3.5 billion nucleotides. Um, viruses have very small genomes, and they don't have good ways of um, fixing their DNA or their genes. And they also do weird things like have sex with each other. So, say, if two different strains of the flu come into the same cell, their genes might get mixed up and repackaged, and all of a sudden you have this bizarre hybrid virus that wasn't there before. So all this means that viruses have an incredibly high mutation rate. This graph here sh can give you a sense of it. So we're, we are higher eukaryotes. Um, we have a fairly low mutation rate as living things go. But the flu mutates 10,000, maybe 100,000 times faster, depending on the estimates you see. So what that means is that um, even inside of your body, while you're sick, 
you're producing all sorts of new kinds of viruses. Now, a lot of those viruses are just big mistakes. <laughs> they come out of the cell, and they, they're just misfits. They're, their genes don't work. They can't invade another cell. Psh, they're done. Uh, in a few cases, however, they're actually able to do better than the other viruses. And it just takes a little edge for a mutation to let a virus take over a population. And this happens again and again and again and again. So when you're sick with hepatitis or the flu or what have you, viral time is so fast that the viruses are actually adapting to your body. They, they are evolving to fit you and your niche. And this is actually a regular part of disease now, scientists recognize, is, is the evolution of the viruses within you. Now, that is just one aspect, though, of what I'm calling viral time. Now, you think about the mayfly. I mentioned, you know, it comes out of, of uh, the ground, uh, and it, as an adult, it can live for, I'm sorry, it comes out of the water, um, and then it can live for, say, a day. But it was a larvae before that. And actually, if you take the, the full life of a mayfly, it's not that short. It's just that we're quite captivated by being adult for just a day. Um, so, so the mayfly li lives at different scales. And what happens if you step back a little bit further and you say, well, you know, the mayfly exists in a population of mayflies. So maybe there are mayflies that are living around a stream. And maybe that population of mayflies has been there for years or decades, maybe centuries. At, so at that scale of the mayfly, time operates in a, in a very different way. Well, the same goes for viruses, but just more so. Uh, everything with viruses is very extreme, as, as I'll explain uh, tonight. So, for example, um, you know, there are some viruses, like a cold, the rhinovirus that causes the common cold. You get it, you feel lousy for a couple days, and generally your immune system knocks it out, and it's gone. So that population of viruses in your body, it was kind of living on mayfly time. Now, if you got chicken pox, that'd be a little different because the chicken pox might retreat into your nervous system and then come out decades later and cause you shingles. So the hepatitis, uh, hepatitis C, for example, uh, can, uh, in, you know, might infect you as a, as a young person and you wouldn't even know about it for 20 years until suddenly your doctor says, your liver just stopped working. So viruses uh, can exist at these different time scales, just within one person. But they can also, uh, we, we can also step back and think about viruses as populations. So think of viruses as being kind of clouds of DNA, clouds of genes. Um, if, you, if you think of, of uh, you know, the hepatitis C, not just in one person, but in all the hepatitis C around the world, the, the 200 million people who are carrying these viruses inside of them, you can start to ask different kinds of questions about how time works. Because there wasn't, it's not like there was always hepatitis C. There wasn't always HIV. These things come into existence. Now, the way that they come into existence, typically, is that they have come into humans from some animal, usually an animal that's fairly like us. Uh, that's because they can use similar receptors on our cells to get in. They already have equipment that can at least let them get a little bit of entry into, uh, into our biology. A lot of times, this doesn't work out very well. Uh, but sometimes it does. So uh, you have cases, for example, where um, viruses are, are trying, quote-unquote, trying to establish themselves in our species, but they just can't manage it. 
So let's take rabies, for example. Um, you know, there are thousands of people who get infected by rabies every year. Um, they get bit by dogs and bats and other rabid animals, but they don't bite each other. They <laughs> The, there, there's no human rabies virus. I mean, at least they're not biting each other right now. I can't guarantee about the future. I can't guarantee about what David Cronenberg would say. But in any case, as far as we know, there's no human rabies virus. Um, so if, if you were somehow to get rid of all the rabies in dogs and bats and so on, and you left humans alone, there would be no rabies because we couldn't support it. That... That viral cloud just doesn't exist in us. Now, there are other cases where there have been little clouds that have formed. So in 2002, for example, um, there was this, uh, an epidemic that came to be known as SARS. Uh, and it's short for Sudden Acquired Respiratory Syndrome. What happened here was that there was a virus that we just didn't know about before, which suddenly uh, hit the scene in, uh, in China and in, and in Hong Kong. People were starting to get um, hor horrible fevers. Uh, a few people were dying, and so public health workers realized they were dealing with some, some kind of outbreak. They were able to identify the virus that caused it. It wasn't a virus that anyone had seen before. So they said, well, where did it come from? It took a little while to get to the bottom of it. So the, they first found SARS in uh, this animal called palm civet, which is often sold in Chinese animal marketplaces. And so people said, aha, the virus had jumped from the civets to people. Um, that turns out probably not to be the case. Because then, scientists also found a lot more SARS and SARS-like viruses in bats. So it appears that, um, that this virus made a jump from bats into civets and humans where it was circulating around. Now, it's really fascinating to think about what happened with SARS. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the, the younger among you may not be quite clear on what SARS was. For those, those of us who lived through it, we thought, oh my God, this is going to be horrifying. Because uh, several hundred people died of SARS, and nobody really knew what was going to happen. And people were carrying SARS on planes to other countries. Um, it was a terrifying moment. Uh, fortunately... Uh, people were able to stop SARS through some pretty basic public health measures, um, identifying people who were sick, quarantining them, uh, shutting down some of the marketplaces and so on, uh, and SARS disappeared. It has not been seen in humans since. So this was a viral cloud that only existed for really maybe a few months, maybe more, a little bit longer that we don't know about, a, a short period of time. As far as we can tell, there, there is no SARS. Now, that might illustrate how smart we are about dealing with viruses, or it might show how lucky we are, or maybe both. I'm inclined to think both. Um, there are certainly cases where we haven't been so lucky, and where we have, had, um, we have had viruses enter our species and get established. And this, can take, this can take a while. You have to scale back to you know, a time scale of decades to understand some of these kinds of emerging viruses. So, uh, for example, uh, about a century ago, there were some viruses that infected chimpanzees. Now, we didn't know about these viruses in these chimpanzees at the time. They didn't have a name. The chimpanzees that were getting them, they would be spreading them to each other through sex, perhaps through fighting and transmitting it through blood. In any case, this, these viruses would attack the immune system of these chimpanzees. They were slow viruses. They weren't like a cold. They weren't like Ebola. 
they took a long time to make their effects felt on these animals. So initially, the chimpanzees' immune systems could, could ward off the disease, the virus, and at least keep it in check. But over the years, the chimpanzees' immune systems were eroded until they started to become sick with things that normally they wouldn't get sick of from. So over this long scale of viral time, the chimpanzees started to weaken and die. They would, they would die years before the normal uh, lifespan of a chimpanzee. Now, we wouldn't have known about this chimpanzee virus if it hadn't been for the radical changes that we brought to the world of chimpanzees. Uh, we started cutting down their forests, we started making more contact with them, and in Africa, people started hunting chimpanzees in large amounts for food. And th this is just a picture from the, the bushmeat trade, which started to become a very important part of, of getting protein uh, in certain parts of Africa. And it was probably in Cameroon where this bushmeat trade brought people into contact with what came to be known as HIV. Now, initially, there were probably a lot of failed attempts to cross that barrier. And when I say attempts, I mean in sort of a non-conscious way. Um, there would be infections where people would pick up these chimpanzee viruses and nothing much came of it. But there was this opportunity, there was this new niche, and the viruses were replicating and there were mutations that allowed some of the viruses to survive in the human body, and they did better and better at surviving in the human body and going from human to human than living in chimpanzees. And eventually they became HIV instead of the chimpanzee virus. And this is a, a, a tree, an evolutionary tree, that shows the relationship between those chimpanzee viruses and human viruses. So in this picture, the human uh, branches are in yellow. And so you can see, actually, that um, it's likely that HIV jumped from chimpanzees to humans three times. Uh, there, there may have been more times, but we're not sure. Um, and you can actually look at the mutations in those viruses, those mutations I was talking about that happened so much, to, to actually estimate when the, this changeover happened. Probably happened in the early 1900s. It just so happens to be when all those changes that I told you about were occurring in, um, in Africa where uh, HIV got its start. Not only that, but you can then uh, track the spread of HIV by looking uh, at, at these mutations. So you can see where it spread to other places. There are people from Haiti who were in Africa at the time who came back to Haiti, brought the virus with them. There were, it, you can track how it spread to the United States. Uh, and so by the time that HIV actually kind of made itself known, as it were, 30 years ago, it had actually been around for perhaps 50 years. And it had been hiding because it had this stealthy way of passing through time, of, of being hidden for, for such a long period of time in its hosts that it was sort of hard to figure out how to link the symptoms to a particular virus. Now, here's a case where we can go back in time and look at the origin of a virus. We can do it by looking at the mutations. Um, you can even go back, as, as some scientists have, to tissue collections, and they can find HIV from as far back as 1959. <clears throat> but it's not as if there were no viruses before the 20th century when scientists could actually see viruses for the first time. Viruses have been with us for a very long time. So I want you to step back on a longer time scale. So how, so how do we know that viruses have been around for a long time? Well, they've kind of left their mark on, on human history. Um, even in the names that we give to viruses. So let's take, for example, influenza. Kind of has a nice ring to it. If you just stop and not think about what it's like to have the flu, you say influenza. It sounds like a village somewhere in Tuscany or something. Uh, it's an Italian word 
which means influence. The influence they were talking about was the influence of the stars that were believed in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance to control our health. And in some cases, to cause terrible epidemics associated with fevers and aches and often death. So, uh, so you can go back through history and, and see the mark that certain viruses have left on, on, on that history. Uh, you can even see the mark on people themselves. So this is actually probably the oldest sign of viruses in human civilization. This is Ramses V, Pharaoh of Egypt, about 3,000 years ago. And you might be able to see there are lots and lots of pock marks on his face. And that was smallpox. So, uh, so Ramses, you know, even the Pharaoh, um, could be felled by smallpox 3,000 years ago. So, so viruses uh, span all of human civilization. Okay, we've gone from minutes to hours to days to decades, centuries, millennia. But it's not as if before the rise of human civilization, we lived in some sort of, you know, uh, pre-viral Eden. We know that our early ancestors got sick with viruses too. Now, going back into that, that prehistory of viruses, before, uh, you know, the records that we humans kept, it's not easy. You can't dig up a fossil of a virus like you can a trilobite. But you can look at viruses themselves and their genes as kind of a fossil record. So, for example, there are some viruses like uh, CMV, cytomegalovirus, where there are some really striking patterns about its evolution. So we humans get one kind of cytomegalovirus, and the closest relative to that virus are in other primates. And if, if you go out along the branches of the CMV evolutionary tree, you go out on the branches of the primate tree as well. So what that suggests is that uh, these viruses have kind of diverged along with their hosts. They haven't switched around a lot, like I showed you with HIV. They've been very loyal to their host, and when their host gives rise to a new species, they form new species too. But what's really amazing to me is that there is actually a fossil record in our own genome. And I want to explain to you how we know that. Uh, I want to jump back again to HIV. Now, remember how I showed you before how the way the flu replicates. HIV and viruses like it have a somewhat different way of going about their business. They infect cells, but when they infect cells, their genes don't just sort of spill out. Their genes actually get inserted quite precisely into the host cell's genome. So in effect, they have become part <coughs> of the host cell's genome. Now, typically what happens is that they, they get into that genome and their genes basically instruct the cell to make lots of new HIV. And the HIV pops out of the cell and eventually the cell just wipes out, ruptures, dies, end of story. But sometimes, with these kinds of viruses, something happens a little bit differently. So imagine what happens if one of these viruses, the, this group of viruses is called retroviruses, imagine if it gets into an egg. Now imagine what happens when that egg is fertilized and it becomes two cells. Now those two cells both have the virus's DNA in them, and then four cells. They all have the viral DNA in the genome, too. That, when that egg develops into an adult, every single cell in that organism's body carries that viral DNA in it. So in a sense, the virus has, has fused to its host. So you know, if you think of, of viruses as being kind of, uh, let's abandon the cloud metaphor and think of rivers. So it's like a river of genes going through time. 
Well, now its river and its host river have, have merged together. Now, when this happens, uh, the, the, this retrovirus is called an endogenous retrovirus, meaning it's within. Uh, now, initially, it may be possible for that DNA of the virus to, to produce new viruses that can go infect other cells or other hosts, um, but they mutate along with the rest of our DNA, and after a while, those viruses just get uh, so disabled by cr mutations that they're stuck there. They're just, we just carry them along in our genome. And we actually have a lot of these. And you can go and look through the human genome, and you'll be going along, and you say, like, okay, well, that's a gene for collagen, and okay, that's a gene for keratin. And then you're going along, and you say, whoa, wait a minute. That's a gene for a protein shell for a virus like HIV in our own genome. And you can see it. It might be a little bit degraded, but the signature is clear enough that you can see it. And there are actually multiple copies sometimes of these uh, viruses because once they lose the ability to the break out and infect other hosts, they could still make copies of themselves that get put back in. So uh, there's one of these um, which is called um, HERVK. Um, where we have a number of copies in our genome. And it's believed that they come from a virus that infected our ancestors maybe, say, about 2 million years ago. So that's a hypothesis. Uh, but, you know, these, this is just stretches of DNA. How do we know that they were really a virus? Well, some French researchers came up with a really clever way of testing this. Um, so, so this is the hypothesis showing how a virus would go into um, a germ cell, egg or sperm, and then eventually would become just part of the human genome. To understand how these scientists um, figured this out, that, that, that these particular stretches of DNA really were from viruses, let me give you a kind of a thought experiment. Um, let's say that uh, today um, several of your friends um, texted you and said, hey, you going to go hear that talk, viral time? But, you know, iPhones, fat thumbs, you know, autocorrect, what have you. <laughs> you get mistakes. Um, so you get, uh, the, you get all these different versions of the talk tonight. Uh, and you're, you're just thinking, like, what, 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 what did they have in mind? What was the original message? Well, you know, leaving aside your ability to... to um, Let's say you didn't, you couldn't actually like look at that and sort of recognize the words. Let's just say you used pure powers of deduction. Well, what you, one thing you could do is you could just identify the letters that were a little different in each one. As you can see here, each one only has one that's different. And from that, you can, you can pretty safely assume that the original title was Viral Time, that these are sort of the, the offspring, the mutant offspring that your friends sent you. Well, this is what these um, French scientists did. Uh, uh, basically, they, they worked their way back from these different versions of this virus in uh, our genome, and they said, okay, we think that this was the original uh, sequence of the virus, that we think was a virus uh, that infected our ancestors. So they, they synthesized this genetic sequence. They made a piece of DNA and they stuck it in the human cell. And lo and behold, it made viruses. So here we have a virus we have been carrying for two million years. It's been hanging along quietly, minding its own business. And these scientists had the gall to bring it back to life. <laughs> So these are actually pictures of the virus budding out, uh, of the new viruses budding out of the cell when they put that, that gene sequence in. Now, this is just two million years. Actually, um, you, can, you can track the evolution of these, these, these things way back. One of the ways you can do that is look at our relatives. So, for example, there are some viruses that are found only in um, our, us and our closest relatives, like the great apes. So they must have 
they must have infected our ancestors at that point in time, the common ancestor of great apes, which lived, say, about 10 million years ago. You can find other of these viruses that in the genomes of humans, apes, old world monkeys. And so that pushes you back further in time still. You can find others that infect uh, all placental mammals. That puts you, puts you back way back in time. Um, and what's really amazing is that uh, there are a lot of these viruses in your genome. Scientists have identified about 100,000 elements in your genome that came from viruses. Now, to put that in perspective, um, we all have 20,000 protein-coding genes. That takes up about 1.2% of our genome. Viruses, these things take up about 8 or 9%. So you could say you're about six times more virus than you are human, <laughs> if you're so inclined. So, so we're, we're dealing with, with a time scale that, uh, that, that we carry in our own bodies that is really, you start to get into unimaginably old periods of time. I mean, I've just marked an era where the Grand Canyon formed. And you have viruses that are older than that in your own genome. Um, this, is a, this is a deeply weird con concept. I mean, that to think of our human genome having been gradually eroded, like the Grand Canyon, for millions of years by viruses. Um, now, our genomes didn't, you know, go willingly. Uh, we actually have lots of genes that seem to be specifically uh, adapted for fighting off these viruses as they try to enter the genome and then as they try to replicate. Um, we try to put a stop to this because it can be very disruptive. I mean, if a, if a virus plops in and, does, and happens to plug itself where there's a really essential gene, there can be trouble. Um, these, a lot of retroviruses are associated with cancer. So evolution has favored defenses against these things. But that's not to say that these viruses haven't ended up being useful. Actually, mutations can essentially borrow some of the genes from viruses and use them to benefit us. Uh, and my favorite example, and really the most startling one, uh, is one that's involved with pregnancy. So, uh, in, order to, um, in, in order for an a, uh, embryo, a, a mammal embryo to develop, I should say a placental mammal embryo, um, it has to form a placenta which attaches to the uterus. And in many groups of mammals, what happens then is that there is a layer that forms here, these sort of uh, kind of purplish cells here. That's a layer that allows the embryo to draw in nutrients from the mother and, and to attach to the, to the uterine wall. And it's very distinctive because it's formed by cells, but then the walls between the cells break down. And so it's just sort of a, a big open kind of layer of, of cytoplasm, cell juice, basically. There's a protein that makes that happen. If you knock the gene out from mice... Um, they cannot reproduce. It, 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 is, it is fatal to an embryo not to be able to form that layer with that protein. That protein comes from a virus. Actually, this, this has happened repeatedly in evolution. Different mammal lineages have actually borrowed the similar uh, viral genes to make that layer. So if it wasn't for viruses, none of us would have even been born. Now, um, I've taken you back now about 100 million years, but really to appreciate the full scope of, of viral time, um, I need to actually um, take you back a bit further. And to do that, we have to sort of leave the, leave the mammals behind, leave the animals behind, and look at really the, the most important hosts on the planet, and those are the microbes. Um, they outweigh us, 
They're much more important in terms of uh, the biogeochemistry of the planet. This is really a, a microbial planet, and those microbes are heavily uh, infected with their own viruses. They're, they're called bacteriophages. Um, so this actually shows you an E. coli, which is, is, being, uh, which is actually popping out lots of new uh, phages that are going to go off and infect other ones. So, where can you find these phages? Uh, well, inside of all of you. Uh, because you have trillions of bacteria inside of you that you depend on for your health and survival, and they are uh, getting uh, infected regularly by phages. So each of you, uh, who pretty much all sound healthy, um, <laughs> So the healthy among you have four trillion phages inside of you right now. In your nose, in your mouth, in your lungs, in your gut. Um, and you're eating them every day in yogurt, pickles, or all sorts of different foods. You're, you're picking up new phages and they're breeding inside of you and you're releasing them into the environment and we'll leave it at that. Um, we've already had the echromize, so we don't need to think about these things anymore, but in any case, um, you have an incredible diversity of phages inside of you, a estimated about 1,500 different species dwelling inside of you. But they're not infecting you, they're not making you sick, they're, they're after your bacteria. So humans and other animals are wonderful places to find phages, but uh, there are lots and lots and lots of other places to find them. So here's a place called the Cave of Crystals. It's about a mile underground. Um, those are actually crystals uh, that have formed there. Um, you know, 60-ton type crystals, like the biggest, the biggest crystals ever found. Um, it's a marvelous place. They're wearing these spacesuits partly because it's incredibly hot, uh, and, but also because they don't want to infect it with their bacteria. They're actually bacteria that live in the, the water that comes in to this cave from the surrounding rock, and they get infected with viruses. In fact, if you scoop up a spoonful of that water, it'll have 200 million viruses in it. This may not look like a good place to look for viruses, um, but in fact, it's a great place to, because a couple miles underground, uh, under the ice, I should say, in Antarctica, there's something called Lake Vostok. And Lake Vostok is home to an ecosystem dominated by bacteria, and those bacteria have lots of viruses in them. They even actually have viruses that infect other viruses, which is interesting. Um, but in any case, um, just about anywhere you look on Earth where there's life, there are viruses. The ocean actually was thought to be pretty much virus-free for a long time. People just thought, well, how can viruses live in seawater? It's just too harsh. We know better now. Actually, in, if you take that spoon and scoop up a spoon of seawater, you'll find a billion viruses just in that spoonful. Uh, so there are viruses in the soil. There are viruses in all sorts of other places. And so that leads scientists to say, well, how many viruses are there? Uh, you know, and obviously they can't count them all up, but they can do surveys and they can estimate from sampling in ocean and soil and sediment and so on. And this is the number they come up with. It is a big number. That's one with 31 zeros after that. So um, it's kind of hard to think about how many viruses that is. Uh, and my favorite uh, way that scientists have tried to wrap their heads around this is to say, hmm, what would happen if we took every virus on Earth and stacked them one on top of the other? They never explain how they do this, but in any case, <laughs> uh, they say, well, would it extend a mile into the air? Would it go to the moon? Would it go out of the solar system? Well, the answer to all that is no, because actually it would go 100,000 light years. I have an arrow pointing here to a galaxy. That's actually, it would go past galaxies. 
Oh, I'm sorry, 100 million. It was <laughs> you, you, start to, you start to get fuzzy on these numbers after a while because there are just so many. Yes, I'm sorry, that is correct, 100 million light years. Yes, so you, you go out way past your local, ga your local galaxies. So what does it mean that the most abundant organism on Earth by far are viruses? This is why I call the book A Planet of Viruses. If you, if you want to add up organisms, and I consider viruses organisms, uh, viruses are way at the top of the list. What does that mean? Well, one of the things it means is that viruses are planetary forces. So um, here, here's another example of, of uh, viral time. Um, viruses are continually infecting uh, microbes in the ocean. Um, there's, a, there's a vast number of infections that are happening every second. And in many of the ca those cases, they are, are uh, making lots of copies inside those bacteria and then blowing up the bacteria to get out. And they're dumping all the carbon inside of the bacteria into the ocean. Viruses kill half of all the bacteria in the ocean every day. Now, what happens is that carbon, scientists don't really know because they, they've just, you know, figured this math out in the last few years and they're saying, wait a minute, this is incredible. This is a, a colossal amount of carbon. Now, some of it is probably sinking down to the, the ocean floor. Some of it might actually be fertilizing the growth of microbes in the, in the upper ocean. It's probably having a huge effect on a lot of different things. One of the things, maybe, is climate. Because by screwing up the carbon cycle, as it were, um, they're affecting how much carbon that the, uh, the ocean can absorb from the atmosphere. And thereby, helping to, to set the climate. Because in the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide is trapping heat. Scientists can't say, you know, if it wasn't for viruses, the Earth would be so many degrees warmer or colder because there are many complex uh, effects of these viruses. We just don't know yet, but we know it's got to be big. Now, the other weird thing about viruses in the ocean, and this is something I'll get to in more detail in a second, is that not all the viruses are killing uh, their hosts. A lot of viruses I'm, uh, actually regularly insert their, their genes into a microbial host, and that's it. They just hang out. Now, they can still every now and then make new viruses and pop out if they need to, but pretty much they're along for the ride. And when these viruses go from host to host, they can sometimes pick up host genes and carry them along with them. And then after a while, they can create kind of a whole kind of shopping cart full of genes, which they can bring to a new host. And there are actually some viruses floating around the ocean that carry a whole bunch of genes for photosynthesis. Now, they can't photosynthesize on their own. What they do is they go and they find a, a bacterium, they infect it, they insert their genes into the, into the microbe, and all of a sudden, the microbe turns green in the sense that it can now photosynthesize. It couldn't before. When it gets infected, it can start harnessing, harvesting sunlight. And it's believed that about 10% of the photosynthesis in the ocean um, is produced this way. Penny Chisholm from MIT has been studying these bacteria and the viruses that infect them. And she has just found that this is happening around the world. So... In every breath you take, you are breathing in some, some oxygen from viruses. So uh, the reason that I'm, I'm talking so much about uh, microbes and their viruses is that for a long time, that's what this planet was like. Uh, it was a microbial planet. This is a picture of stromatolites, which are microbial mats. These are from Australia. And... Uh, these were the, you know, the big players on the planet um, for perhaps the first couple billion years. These stromatolites are loaded with viruses. And so that's a pretty good clue that there were viruses on the very early Earth. Another way of figuring out how old viruses are on a, on a sort of Earth history scale 
is to look at the tree of life. Um, and we can look at those endogenous retroviruses I showed you before. Um, they only go back about 100 million years before the signal gets kind of fuzzy. So then scientists have to look at the viruses themselves. Uh, this is a tricky thing because the viruses are mutating so fast that it can be hard to really see their deep history in their genes because um, the, the DNA mutates so much that sometimes it kind of erases its own record of itself. It mutates and mutates again and mutates again, and you can't, you can't do that reconstruction I was showing you. But we've got a growing catalog of virus genes that are being gathered by people like Craig Venter. So after Craig Venter um, uh, uh, led the, the private effort to sequence the human genome, um, he took off on his yacht with a bunch of other scientists, and they started scooping up seawater and basically uh, sequencing every gene they could find in them. And there are millions of genes, many of which were from viruses. And so as scientists have more of this kind of data to look at, they start to see some really big patterns to those viral genes. This is kind of a, a classic, now classic view of life. So we are part of that eukarya branch. We're about here. And there, scientists recognize three main branches, the bacteria, the eukarya, and the archaea. Well, by looking at these viral genes, scientists have discovered that they're pretty weird. And this is a particularly groovy um, illustration, actually published in a scientific paper, but uh, you know, I, I salute their aesthetics. <clears throat> so you've got bacteria, uh, bacteria, archaea, uh, uh, and eukaryotes over here, the three domains. And then over here, you have um, a viral branch. These are, these are virus, genes, virus genes that are really way off on their own. And scientists are now arguing that there should, we should recognize a fourth domain in life, which is represented by viruses. Not all viruses, uh, but a particularly uh, interesting bunch of them called giant viruses, which were discovered just a few years ago. Um, they've probably been sitting in front of us, and we just haven't realized they're viruses because they were too big. Uh, they, scientists literally just thought they were bacteria. Um, but it turned out they're viruses. They just happen to be viruses with way too many genes in them, and they're just way too big to be recognized as viruses. Um, in any case, so now we sort of see that viruses have this incredible ancestry in their genes. Um, and I just wanted to point out these things here. This looks a little bit different than Darwin's branching pattern. That's because the viruses are, viruses would shuffle genes back and forth between the different domains. So, so uh, you know, all of life is, is a, a product of this, this, this mosaic created in large part by viruses. And this is a process that's still going on. Um, the, the E. coli outbreak uh, that started up in Europe in May um, Turns out it's a strain of E. coli that seemed totally harmless before, um, but basically viruses delivered a bunch of genes to it that turned it into this vicious killer. So this is, you know, we've got two time scales here. We've got the time scale of last week and the time scale of four billion years. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, ask me, well, okay, when did viruses start? And you know, I don't think anybody really knows that, but th there's a certain logic that leads you to believe that viruses were there as soon as there was anything that we consider alive. Because basically, uh, it's just a great way of making a living. You just, you just exploit others. <laughs> and, uh, you know, unfortunately, cheating is, is a very successful strategy in life. And so you can imagine you don't even need cell walls. Imagine that you've just got genes floating around and they're interacting with each other. And these, these genes are being very polite with each other and, and working together and cooperating and they're producing more copies of themselves. That could be a great target for a virus that gets those, those genes to make copies of itself instead of themselves. Uh, the, the last uh, issue that I want to talk about in terms of the deep past of life is DNA. 
So DNA is this marvelous molecule, double-stranded way of storing information, and um, it's, it's a very peculiar virus. Uh, <laughs> it's a very peculiar molecule. Um, scientists have had a, had a hard time trying to figure out how DNA itself evolved from you know, the building blocks of life. Fortunately, there, there's a pretty clear possibility for what came before DNA. When DNA is used to make proteins, a single-stranded version is produced called RNA. And it turns out that RNA does lots of other things in our cells, too. Um, and so it, can, it might be able to act kind of like a gene and a protein. So maybe we started with RNA and then went to DNA. Well, how did we do that? How did that happen? Um, Patrick Forterra, a French uh, researcher at the Pasteur Institute, argues that actually viruses evolved DNA first. Um, they would infect RNA cells, and the RNA cells would attack them um, in the same way that bacteria actually can attack the viruses that infect them. So uh, there were some viruses that evolved a double-stranded version of their genes, which protected them, and it was a great way to get into your host and protect your genes so they wouldn't get cut up. And then eventually, um, the hosts co-opted the DNA and used it for their own genes. It's a very, it's a very um, obviously, a very speculative hypothesis, but it is something that you can test by looking at viruses and very exotic microbes. And so it's actually stimulating a lot of research on the weirder forms of life on Earth. So that's the past. And I just want to end by talking briefly about the future. Um, I, I, I'm always a little leery of trying to, um, to, to look into the future. I don't think anybody does a good job of it, and least of all myself. However, we're, we're here uh, at the Long Now, and we're thinking about the future. So um, there are a few informed guesses that I can make. One is to expect more flu. <laughs> if there's anything I'm sure of, we will continue to have the flu. Um, the, our children will get the flu, our grandchildren will get it, um, and not only that, but we're going to be um, fighting the flu. We're not going to eradicate it. The problem is that, as I mentioned before, viruses are very sexy. Uh, they, they like to mix it up, and this is a diagram just showing how two different viruses in one cell can produce these new kinds of viruses. These are viruses that can escape our immune system's attack, they can escape our vaccines, which is why you need to take a vaccine every year. Uh, and this is a diagram just showing what happens over the course of a year. This is going to continue to happen. We're not going to be able to stop this process. Now, every now and then, um, flu viruses um, take a shift. We, we go from different combinations of the existing flu viruses to something that's really different from what we've seen before. Where do they come from? They come from birds. In birds, actually, the flu is a gut uh, infection. They get sick in their gut, but it can make us sick in our airways. And all the human flus, all the human flu strains are just in these three groups. So there's lots more flu virus, lots more diversity of flu uh, that could make it into us. Now, a lot of these are going to be dead-end infections, but some are going to make it through. Um, the swine flu uh, that, of 2009 was actually a cocktail of a couple different pig flus, plus a human flu, plus a bird flu. It's just a big old orgy going on uh, that eventually produced what is now uh, the dominant seasonal flu strain. Uh, and... You know, I, I don't expect us to be getting rid of um, these sort of farm factories anytime soon. I expect we're going to have industrial-scale pig farming. And all that means great opportunities to make more flu. Um, now, there are probably going to be uh, other cases where viruses show up that we didn't even see before. So um, there's an interesting study uh, that I uh, have written about for the New York Times that came out recently about hepatitis C. It infects 200 million people. There are, until just a couple weeks ago, uh, there were no reports of any hepatitis C-like viruses out there in animals. So people said, well, where did it come from? Um, 
a lot of people thought, well, maybe it came from chimpanzees because you can actually experimentally infect a chimpanzee with hepatitis C. Uh, and they, they were actually being studied in terms of developing uh, hepatitis, hepatitis C treatments that way. Well, uh, some scientists actually discovered the, the first close relative of hepatitis C, that thing with the, the red dot there. And all those yellow guys are hepatitis C strains. Um, they actually uh, discovered in an unexpected place. So you can see it's called CHV. What does the C stand for? It stands for canine. There were these dogs that were suffering from respiratory diseases in kennels, and scientists were trying to figure out what the virus was. It didn't match any virus they'd seen before. When they sequenced the genes, it had come from a, a virus that was a lot like hepatitis C. So it's, it's likely that, uh, or at least uh, one, of the, one of the strongest hypotheses to explain this virus is that it went from dogs to humans. Now that doesn't mean that your dog is going to give you hepatitis C, but what it does mean is that you know, viruses are going to continue to jump into our species, sometimes from unexpected sources. Now, it's easy when you talk about viruses in the future to get kind of crazy. Um, you know, the many science fiction movies have been made like this. Not just Rabbit, but you know, 28 Days Later, an outbreak. Um, and, you know, there, there are some pretty insane uh, viruses out there in the real world. Baculoviruses, actually, they infect insects. And they grow these incredible numbers. They actually make the caterpillars fat. Um, and then the caterpillars get this urge to climb up to the top of a tree. They get what's called treetop disease. And then they hang off the trees. The virus is making them do these bizarre things. And, uh, and then once they're hanging off the tree, these fat, virus-loaded caterpillars literally dissolve. The virus releases an enzyme. It dissolves the caterpillar entirely. And the viruses rain down on the leaves below where they can be eaten by other caterpillars. And if you go out and you buy a head of lettuce or cabbage today, it's probably covered with millions of baculoviruses. It's okay, though. You're not a caterpillar, okay? <laughs> um, so, you know, when you see that sort of stuff, you say, oh, my God, you know, we're going to get some incredible viral strain. It's going to make us all blow up and dissolve and spray all over other people. And uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't buy that. I don't think so. I mean, uh, uh, I don't think that the, the diseases we're going to be worrying about are going to be things like Ebola. I just don't. I think they're gonna, we're going to be worried about a replay of 1918 where 50 million people died. Billions of people actually got infected with this, this particular strain of flu. Quote, unquote, only 50 million people died. It was able to be so devastating because it could spread so easily. And part of that meant that it wasn't totally fatal. It wasn't, it wasn't science fiction-y. It was just horrifying. And so that you ended up with this relatively small fraction of people who were infected who died. But still, because it infected such a huge part of the planet, the death toll was astonishing. Um, you know, another possibility uh, might be an HIV-like thing or a hepatitis C-like thing where maybe there's some new virus already among us and we don't even know it yet. And it's not going to make itself known for years. And by then, maybe it's going to be a global epidemic. That's what happened with hepatitis C and HIV. I don't, no, I don't want to be too pessimistic, though. Um, we have had a few triumphs. So smallpox, for example is now restricted, as far as we know, only to two laboratories in the United States and Russia. That's it. Rinderpest, which is a virus that uh, killed cows, gone. So we have had some triumphs. Um, there are, you have to be, only certain kind of viruses can, can enjoy this, well, can suffer, I should say, this kind of fate. Um, I think with things like a HIV, we're going to sort of have a, a slow, uh, gradual conquest. So you can see, actually, adult and, death, adult and child deaths due to AIDS are actually in the, on the decline. And there is finally some research that's suggesting that maybe we can actually eradicate the virus instead of controlling antivirals. Um, you know, what, what I think is going to be really interesting in terms of viruses, is the positive side, the upside of viruses. Uh, so I, I mentioned, you know, none of us would be here without viruses because they help us uh, stick to the, the uterine wall. 
uh, we actually make some viral proteins in our brains. Nobody knows what they're doing there, but they clearly come from, from viruses that became part of us. Um, those baculoviruses I mentioned, um, they're great for pesticide. It's a great way to kill off pests you don't like. Um, and uh, you can actually genetically engineer the viruses so that instead of, they, they like to make these protein balls where the viruses are embedded, kind of like a fruit cake you would not want to eat. Uh, you can engineer the virus so that, the, that it makes, instead of the, the regular baculovirus protein, it makes any protein just about that you want. And so actually it's very important in biotechnology now. Um, we actually now, right now, have viruses building batteries. Uh, Angela Belcher at MIT has pioneered using viruses as, as uh, um, little robots, as it were, to assemble things just by engineering them so that they can grab uh, elements and assemble them together. Um, and they do it very quickly. Uh, and finally, really, the, 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 the most interesting idea, the most speculative, is um, what if we could um, use viruses to treat the whole planet. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about geoengineering our way out of the trouble we've gotten ourselves into. Um, viruses uh, are, are exerting a huge control over the planet's um, biogeochemical cycles and probably the climate. So if we were to um, engineer viruses to, to alter uh, bacteria in the oceans, what could we do? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know too much about the future. I'm pretty sure that humans won't be around in a couple million years. But I am sure that as long as there's life on Earth, uh, there will be viruses. And that is the one prediction uh, that I will be, I'll make with total confidence. So thank you so much for coming, and i um, be happy to talk with Stuart. Let's go sit. Uh, that was sensational. I, I can't think of a speaker who has twerked his subject so far into uh, the long now. Thank you for doing that. No, I, I enjoyed it, yeah. So, um, one term I came across recently doing research on mostly microbes, but then seeing how the viruses or these uh, DNA, these gene transporters, there's the term called the pan-genome. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it, and do you think it's a, a way to think about stuff? So the pan-genome is a, uh, a term that came up when scientists started sequencing the genomes of, um, of bacteria. Mm -hmm. So, for example, they sequenced the genome of E. coli, or rather, I should say, they sequenced one kind of E. coli, um, the standard laboratory one that everybody studies, called K12. And they're like, okay, we've got K12, great. It's about 3,000 genes, and now we know E. coli. Well, then they sequenced another uh, strain of E. coli. I believe the, the next one they did was uh, one that's called 0157H7, which is the one that um, makes hamburger a little dodgy sometimes if you don't cook it all the way through, and it was caused the spinach outbreak uh, a few years back. And they thought, well, we'll see like a couple different, you know, genes in it that uh, make it kind of unhealthy as opposed to harmless. Uh, and they found, I think it was about, they found a, like roughly like a, a, like a third of the genes from K12 were missing from 015787 and vice versa. It was crazy. I mean, basically there was sort of a backbone of kind of E. coli genes, but then there were hundreds of genes that were not shared by them. So you had sort of a Venn diagram like this. Mm -hmm. And then they sequenced another E. coli genome. And they discovered that it had some genes in common with one, and then the other, and the other. So the Venn diagram, you had three of the Venn diagrams. They started to get like, you know, 12 circle Venn diagrams after a while, and they said, this is crazy. There's no, there are very few genes that all E. coli have. They're all E. coli, but, you know, e. Col you know one E. coli might have 3,000 genes, the pan-genome, that is, the genes found in all E. e. coli's, I think they're up to 20 or 30,000 genes, more genomes and genes than the human genome. 
So, and those genomes are being, those genes are being moved from strain to strain by viruses. And so it's happening all the time. It's happening in our bodies. It's happening in the environment. Um, so you can't, yeah, so you, you can't just think of there being a genome for a species. Things are much more dynamic and complex than that. Sounds like we're talking about a planetary scale genome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and viruses are the, are, the, are the things to do it. I mean, uh, the, the, the viruses I show, uh, the, I showed the picture of the Cave of Crystals in Mexico. The mm -hmm. viruses in there. Uh, th their closest relatives seem to be on the other side of the world, in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so the viruses are traveling down probably through um, underground uh, connections uh, across the world. Uh, viruses travel really fast. Um, you know, they, they, they showed up, West Nile virus showed up in the United States in, I believe, in 99. Within a few years, they were across the whole continent. So they catch right on airplanes. Do they also just, you know, travel through the air? Uh, they'll be more likely to, to uh, travel in birds, you know, mm. uh, if they're, if, in case of West Nile virus. Um, they'll, they'll travel, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are um, plant viruses that are, you know, that spread across countries very quickly. And so they mm. might be riding on pollen and things like that. Um, you know, naked viruses don't do that well in the air. That's why flu virus is particularly bad in the winter, because ah. the droplets hang. Mm -hmm. And so if I sneeze on you, mm -hmm. it's more likely, boop, that you're going to get sick. If in the summer, I'd sneeze, <coughs> and it, yeah, right. But in the summer, it kind of go, beep, bonk, mm -hmm. and it'd be on the floor, out. So Kevin Kelly raises the question of, with all this variety, how can you refer to species? And you said there's 1,500 species of virus on board us. What's the species? What's the species? I wrote a whole article about, you know, what is the species? And um, it, it's, it's not even easy to define species among animals and plants. Mm. When you get to viruses, it's, it's kind of a nightmare. Um, uh, even with microbes, too. I mean, basically... Um, when I say species, uh, when I talk about a virus, I mean a relatively distinct lineage that's different than um, other kinds of viruses. So some of the microbial guys talk about sort of functional species-like units. Mm -hmm. Does that also apply in viruses, or are you just talking about lineages of genes with them? Um, I, I don't think this thinking about virus species has gotten that far. And, and, <laughs> and, and actually, like a lot of virologists say, it just doesn't even matter. They're, they're, they're so, you know, sp the, the idea of species is something that we really developed as humans looking around in the world and figuring out what to eat and what not to eat. And um, it, it's, it's kind of a, a, it's a quaint concept that doesn't really work in the microbial world. So um, 1,500 varieties? What, you know, why, what's that number actually specify, if anything? Really, it's, it, it, it all comes down to the tree, the, the evolutionary tree. So mm. these are 1,500... Um, <coughs> twigs. Twigs, yeah. yeah. Okay. They, where, where, you know, the, 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 the influenza are, are, you know, really close to each other, very, very far away from, you know, the phages and so on. It's, it's more of an evolutionary perspective on it. Let the record show he was waving both his hands very rapidly. <laughs> um, I'm not the only one. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Aren't we all? Chris Galat, uh, Glop has a question of phage therapy was explored mm. in the early 20th century. Could it be revived? Yes, it could be. So uh, I didn't have time to talk about this, so thank you. Um, uh, so phages were discovered in World War I by a Canadian-born doctor named Felix Durrell. He was treating soldiers who were sick with dysentery in France during the war. I mean, dysentery was a horrible uh, killer at the time. No antibiotics to treat them. Um, and he was analyzing them, and one of the things they would do is they would filter uh, the stool samples. And so he would actually filter and filter and filter them, um, you know, mixed with water. And then he would filter them finally through porcelain. So it's too small for bacteria to get through. And he had this clear solution. And he could take that solution, and then he, would, he could put it into um, a colony of dysentery bacteria, actually a form of E. coli, and it would kill them. And he realized that what he had was viruses that only attack bacteria. Very controversial idea at the time. Um, he had Nobel Prize winners saying, you're crazy, this is not right. But he turned out to be right. Um, and he immediately said, 
I could use this to treat my patients. And he did. Um, and he would, he would go and, and do one spectacular case after another of, of curing people with phages. Um, it was such a sensation that um, if you read the book Aerosmith, um, mm -hmm. that's based on Durrell. They made a movie out of it. So uh, you have the movie star now uh, of this virologist. Uh, and he actually went into business. The company that became L'Oreal made these sort of phage pads that you could use like on a, to disinfect a wound. Antibiotics n totally knocked this out in the West. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so people all shifted to antibiotics. However, phage therapy, as it's known, survived in the Soviet Union. Um, and there were researchers there who had learned from Durrell. He had visited there and kept developing the phage therapy. Soviet soldiers in World War I would be treated with the wounds on the, on the front. Uh, they'd be treated with phages applied to the wounds. After the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the idea of phage therapy started to trickle back into the West. And now that we have this horrible crisis with antibiotics, uh, phage therapy is starting to look kind of attractive again. And not only that... Sorry. Why, why is it a workaround? Well, antibiotics. Yes. Yeah. Well, for starters, you know, antibiotics, um, as antibiotics fail, um, we have very few new ones coming down the pipeline. So mm -hmm. we're getting to a situation where you have certain resistant strains of bacteria where you really hope that, a, you know, one really heavy duty antibiotic works on them because you've got nothing else. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at that point now. We, we had this great. 50-year run where antibiotics were the silver bullet, took care of everything. And I, we're starting to come to the end of that, where, we're, where doctors are dealing with patients they cannot treat because they don't have the drugs anymore. So antibiotics, were just, which are essentially you know, chemicals produced by microbes, um, it takes a very long time for them to go through the pipeline and be developed. We've got... You know, nature has all these phages hmm. um, just at the ready that we could just, you know, and, and for each uh, species of bacteria, um, there are lots and lots of different species of uh, phages that could attack them. So you have this ready-made, you know, pharmacopoeia hmm. waiting. And not only that, but we can engineer them now to make them even more effective. So phage therapy might finally come back. Uh, this raises a question that Ryan Phelan asks, uh, with so much death and destruction, why don't we see more viruses that make us smarter, better looking, or longer lived? Wouldn't this work out better for everyone involved? <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be great. Um, well, you know... May, uh, and won't, won't iGEM be coming up with viruses pretty soon that uh, will make us smarter and longer lived and stuff? Well, certainly viruses are, um, certainly viruses are, are an important part of gene therapy. Uh, uh, right. So viruses are being used as vehicles to deliver genes to okay, cells. Okay, so if you can use therapy to uh, cure a disease, can't use therapy like that to uh, give you an extra eyebrow or something? If you <laughs> want, I don't know. Um, you you would have to figure out something that could could uh, effectively uh, and reliably infect an embryo or a fertilized egg and always insert in the right place. I mean, it's it's. It's a tricky operation. Uh, so, you know, the, for the caterpillars, it was crap to <laughs> explode and dissolve. But uh, if, you can, if you can do stuff like that to caterpillars, it could make them smarter and more beautiful and longer lived, right? I think it's easier to make a caterpillar explode and dissolve than to make a caterpillar smart. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a science writer, but that's my guess. <laughs> Back to death and destruction. A question from Barry okay. uh, <laughs> Gurdon. Right. That's easy. Uh, is there any way we would know if viruses have caused species extinctions in the past? Um, that's a good question. Or, or in the future. Or in the future. Well, um, it's, it's conceivable. Um, uh, certainly uh, the way that uh, there are some viral outbreaks going on these days, um, they're, they're quite surprising in how uh, ravaging they are. And um, so, for example, um, I mentioned um, the, the endogenous retroviruses, the, the viruses that become one of us. Well, um, koalas right now are actually dealing with um, a really nasty retrovirus um, that is giving them cancer 
and, and, uh, but it's also at the same time inserting itself into their genome so you have some koalas that have it in all their cells and then others that don't and, and then some are dying of cancer and um, it's really one of these situations where they're, they're just wondering if, if um, this could just do them in. I mean, it could con conceivably wipe them out unless, you know, uh, fortunately there's, there's a few koalas like off on an island that haven't gotten this virus. Hmm. Um, if, but, so, so yes, it's imaginable, it, it is imaginable, conceivable that some species have gone extinct because of viruses. Um, Would we know if that had happened? I guess not. Uh, well, there are some researchers who are testing this by looking at, uh, for example, uh, some of the species that died off, uh, species of mammals that died off at the end of the last ice age. Mm -hmm. And they've suggested that maybe humans showing up in nor North America brought with them viruses and just, ah. phew, then they spread like crazy through them. And so they're actually trying to look for certain viruses in the frozen tissues of these uh, animals. So it wasn't spears, it was germs. We don't Maybe. know. It could be a combination. I mean, certainly when uh, Europeans showed up in the New mm. World, they brought smallpox. That's your, you know, that's your tip the scales. No kidding. A uh, question from Shetty. Are prions precursors to viruses or perhaps degenerates, or is this a different subject entirely? So prions are um, misfolded proteins, and um, they, when they come into contact with other proteins, they can sort of force them, as it were, to take their configuration. And um, that's generally believed to be what's behind mad cow disease uh, and some other diseases like Kuru. Um, I would say that they're probably, I, they're, I would just, I think that those are just sort of um, kind of spun off uh, from mammals or other, mm -hmm. you know, animals that are producing proteins. And it's just a, a weakness of a particular kind of protein. Um, I don't think that it has anything to do with the origin of viruses. But... It does so bring they're, up... They're, they're not a parasite, they're a poison. Well, they, they, well they, they certainly do raise this interesting question of what it means to be alive, you know, um, mm. which is a question that people often ask about viruses. And you've moved to thinking they're organisms, therefore alive, yes? Right. So, so, so prions have some of the characteristics we think of as qualifying things as being alive. Mm -hmm. Viruses have more of those things. Um, so I would say they're kind of alive. <laughs> okay, a couple of... The scientific term. Kevin Kelly's always reaching. Um, so two questions. Uh, how much evidence for extraterrestrial viruses linked to, given the scale of viral natural mutation, do you worry about synthetic viruses? Um, okay, so... Um, there, there's, there ha you know, the, um, I believe it was Fred Hoyle... Uh, champion this idea that um, viruses are raining down on us from space. Um, there's no evidence of that. And, um, you know, we, viruses are very much part of this biosphere. When you look at their genes, um, they're not aliens. You know, it, it, but it's certainly interesting to think about. I mean, could... They can uh, presumably manage interplanetary travel, yes. I mean, there's even some bacteria that can do that. So viruses... If a rocket's knocked off the Earth and goes yeah. to Mars, it can have some intact yeah. viruses on board. Now, it would need something for those guys to infect, mm -hmm. to right. parasitize, mm -hmm. in order for them to prosper. Right, right. And as we saw how difficult it is for a virus to get from, you know, a bat, a mammal, mm. into humans, um, that's not a done deal. Because, you know, if there mm. is life on Mars, it's probably fairly different than life on Earth. Question from uh, Graham Lynn. Do viruses ever hop from humans to other species? Um, yes, they do, yes. Uh, 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 unfortunately, humans can um, sort of bequeath viruses to species. Chimpanzees and gorillas are actually um, suffering from um, some, of the, some viruses they're picking up from human contact, which is actually sort of raising some questions about how much tourism and even research there should be on great apes because we can, we can bring them viruses they didn't have before. That's going to put a dent in the ecotourism business. Um, it's a serious issue. Yeah, I, I, I did read about that. So the, some of the mountain gorillas, I guess, are getting what? Flu or what from us? Um, 
for which one yeah, are we, we sneezing on them or we're not hugging them very much we're not we're not but you know we're grabbing onto plants that they're grabbing <sighs> onto and you know it just we're around we're in the neighborhood um, what's the quantity ebola I, mean, for, uh, I, I know gorillas are getting hit by oh um, but it's not clear if they're getting it from us or if it's coming from a reservoir what's the quantity issue here i mean you and I are probably swapping viruses as we speak in each other's direction. <laughs> Only um, the good ones. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you can feel your IQ rising, right? Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> it's true. Everybody in the room is having yeah, that yeah. effect. And I'm, I'm just getting the third eyebrow. So Whereas yeah. the people watching the video don't get that effect. Yeah. They're lost. There's some other things they don't get, though. Uh, you're cold. But... To catch a cold, to catch, uh, sorry, to catch a flu, mm -hmm. it takes more than one virus. It seems like it takes some kind of threshold quantity of, a, you know, a quantity coming in, a certain level of sensitivity in the receiver, all of that stuff. What kind of quantities are we talking about? And if, uh, you know, if the guy behind you in the airplane sneezes once, uh, is that different than if he sneezes 20 times? Uh Obviously, the more they sneeze, the more likely you will be to get infected. But, you know, a droplet could do it. I mean, there are a lot of viruses in a droplet. So, you know, it, yeah, it takes more than one, but uh, more than one virus to, to, to ensure that you get sick. But, you know, a single droplet may hold a whole bunch of viruses. And so um, it, just, it doesn't take much. I would imagine we would be enormously more sicker even than we are if we are that susceptible to that small a quantity of a bad virus. Well, th if, if, that, if those viruses can get through all your defenses, then they might be enough to make you sick. But it's true. We, you know, we, we are picking up viruses all the time, and we're doing a pretty good job of knocking them out. Um, we're just, we're, you know, every day we're, we're, we're waging war. And sometimes we don't notice it. Sometimes, you know, you may just like wake up one day and be like, I don't feel so good. And you just take it easy for the day. And the next day you're, you're feeling better. That might have been, you know, a virus, maybe a virus we haven't yet identified. So it's, it's happening all the time. So our body is maybe doing its own phage therapy or what? Uh, well, no. uh, okay. you, they're, they're, they're doing their own antiviral therapy. <laughs> they're, they're attacking the okay, viruses. Okay, what's our antiviral mechanism? How do we usually deal with the viruses we don't? Is that standard immune system or something else? Yeah, just, well, well there's, there are lots of different ways. Um, you know, we can, uh, our, our bodies can make uh, antibodies to uh, recognize and, and attack some viruses. Um, we actually have, um, you know, uh, genes that allow cells that are being invaded to, to, to fight off them. Um, we have some very cunning kind of strategies encoded in our own genome. So, for example, um, we have proteins that interfere with retroviruses so that they mutate too much. They increase oh. the amount of mutation that happens in, in viruses. And basically, the, they have sort of a mutational meltdown um, so that they become less able to spread. So, 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 so we are, you know, our own cells are tweaking the mutation rate of viruses, which is amazing. Whoa, so I, I like that a lot. You can not, <laughs> not only defeat them by slowing down their mutation rate, but you can defeat them by speeding it up so they just spin out. Yeah, and actually there are a, a bunch of researchers who are trying to um, adapt that concept. Like um, if you had hepatitis or HIV, you could take a pill that would, that would, that would be able to increase the mutation rate um, so that the viruses would kind of go into this mutational overload, but your own cells would be fine. Um, and, you know, that's actually, for HIV, that's actually in clinical trials now. Okay, then the question of the future, you went through a list of things you expect to happen. But you've been tracking the science, and, and part of your whole point now is that the science of virology is moving very rapidly. There's mm -hmm. a lot of discovery going on, more discovery than there is understanding in some respects. Mm -hmm. um, what's your sense of how the science will proceed over the next couple decades? What, what remains to be discovered? What's important? Um, mm. what, what do you think you'll be reporting for the next while? What kind of scientists are you keeping an eye on? Yeah. 
Uh, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm a couple things. So I'm, I'm really uh, fascinated by the people who are looking for viruses in extreme environments um, because they are really stretching out uh, our understanding of, of where viruses live and, and how, what they can tolerate. Um, I mean, really, um, th viruses are the frontier of biodiversity um, because, I mean, if you took... It sounds like it's also the frontier of evolution. If, if they're the big evolutionary apparatus yeah. that you described, Darwin is behind the times. Well, you know, I mean, Darwin was fascinated by viruses. He just didn't quite realize that they, that, uh, you know, ex what they were capable of. But what I, I guess what I meant by, you know, these people looking for viruses in the environment is that if, if you take a catalog of all the genes on Earth, um, probably most of them are viral genes. If you look at the diversity, like the differences among genes, most of the, the diversity of genes is in the world's viruses. So, the, uh, so if we want to understand life on Earth and its full complexity, we have to understand viruses, and we've only just started. I mean, if you go, I mean, we have high school kids doing science experiments where they scoop up some dirt and they get to name viruses. New, you know, new species. <laughs> um, uh, the, it, most of the viral genes that you scoop up in seawater or in soil or what have you, they don't have any close counterpart in all the databases of genes in the world. So every, so it's not like you're you're finding one little sort of uh, minor variation on a known virus. You keep finding things that are just out in left field every single time you look for new viruses, um, and. So, so there's that, and then I'm also curious about um, looking at what's going on inside of us. You know, what are what are these these viruses doing for us inside of us? These four trillion that are inside of you right now, what are they doing? That's something to think about. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.